Thank you, God, for looking after everyone in this church and the Holy Spirit are in all of us. And can you please take care of Pastor Bed when he does the sermons search for the kids and everyone? And can you please praise Pastor Bed? Good luck to do first slides. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've got a children activity. Uh, Natalie, thank you. Uh, it's our search word for this, for this morning. So all the kids, if you can see Auntie Natalie, maybe put up your hand and she can get a copy of to you um, as, as we begin uh, our sermon this morning. Yeah, all right. So we, we've been um, on a journey for the last three Sabbaths um, on this series called Reasoned. And uh, this series really is about building a case for biblical faith. And what is the, one of the things we really want to um, establish out of this series is that biblical faith makes sense. Can you say amen to that? That it's not just about some emotional experience. While I believe that uh, faith can include some emotional part of it, uh, but also it actually makes cognitive sense to our brains and our minds. And Christianity, I want to propose to you this morning, is not a crutch for the weak, uh, or for that matter, as this man once said, um, that's a bit uh, uh, blurry, but I'm hopefully, hopefully you can read that. It says that religion is the opium of the masses. You know who that was? Karl Marx. Um, He's the father of uh, modern day communism and, and socialism. And he says, you know what, people turn to God or to some type of religion as a, as a way of coping with life because you just cannot cope on your own. Um, the Christian faith is a call to worship. It's a call to worship God in response to the fact that we serve a God of love. And, uh, and every... Every part of who you are is always seeking to worship something. In fact, this man, Tim, Timothy Keller, and some other authors have also arrived at the same conclusion that says that every single person, whether you believe in God or not, whether you're a Christian or not, you worship something. There's no getting away from that. We all Every human being that is born into this world worships something. So we have no choice in, in terms of worship. The only choice we get is what we choose to worship, the object of our worship. So some worship fame and money and everything else and pleasure, and others choose to worship uh, some other, you know, statue of some sort. But the Bible invites you and I to worship the God who made the universe, and everything that is in it. <clears throat> and so the worship of God is best fit, uh, is, the, is the best fit consistent with all the human needs. As, as, as we respond to the love of God in our lives, as we respond in worship to him, there's something in you that tells you that this senses right. This fits right to your needs as, as a human being. And so biblical faith is attractive because the God of the Bible is attractive. If you found God attractive, can you say amen? We serve a very attractive God. In fact, um, he invites you into this journey to reason with him. He says, come now and let's reason together. And another part, I love this verse in Romans chapter 2 verse 4. Uh, that really makes it very powerful to, to see the beauty of this God that you and I serve. It goes and says that, um, do, you think li or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the goodness and the kindness of God leads you to repentance? So this God that you and I meet in the Bible He's not a God who forces himself on you. He's not a God who's going to tell you 
you know, um, to follow him or, or else. He's a God who woos you. He attracts you. He, 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 he bids you to come and, and taste and see, as the Bible says in another verse, that the Lord is good. And so let's do a quick review of what we did last week. And, uh, and then we'll dive into what the topic of today is going to be. So last week we really built a case around the Bible because this is the principal source of Christian faith. Uh, and can this book be trusted? Is it still relevant? Is it still reliable? Can we count on it uh, in this 21st century? And we found four basic reasons why we still can believe the Bible and live our lives according to it. Number one is the fact that it actually changes lives. And what's interesting about how it changes lives is that every person that encounters the Bible and the God of the Bible, their life turns into this consistent person of, um, of, of love and, and concern and kindness and goodness. There's a beauty of a person that comes out after they encounter Jesus of the Bible. And so this change uh, that we find in people's lives is probably one of the most important and effective argument in favor of the Bible. But we also found that uh, there's a historical component to why the Bible is important. Uh, we couldn't enjoy our freedoms today. Freedoms to choose our leaders politically, freedoms to come and worship here freely, had it not been for Scripture. The Bible is the single most important document that has influenced the history of the world, especially in the Western civilization, uh, right from the very beginning to this very point. And number three, we found that in Scripture, there's prophetic predictions that are given in the Bible that have all come to pass. We saw how Jesus has about 300 predictions about him in the Old Testament and how they've all been fulfilled in him. And, and also the fact that how God has predicted how this world is going to end uh, in the book of Daniel chapter 2 where a king had a dream one night and he saw a statue. And in that statue basically the whole history of the world for 2,600 years was told to the very end. And every bit of that has come to pass except for one thing. And that is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And the fourth one we found was that the Bible is verifiable. Uh, that archaeology, the science of archaeology, has in the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years really, has come to really be confirmed by all the findings that people are finding in the Middle East especially. Names of places, uh, the characters that are mentioned in the Bible, and some of the stories have become verifiable as archaeology has, has, has brought a lot of these things uh, up to surface for us to discover. Today we are going to talk about the man himself called Jesus, who is God and man at the same time, who was the instigator of the Christian faith, and in fact the most influential person that has ever walked on the face of the planet, that has changed countless lives and continues to do so even today. I want to invite you to bow our heads together now as we pray. Father, I thank you so much for Jesus, that through him we know who and what God looks like. I uh, thank you for the fact that we're here together today to worship him. And not only that are we here today, but we are also here in his very presence. And Father, I pray that the presence of Jesus through his Holy Spirit will be experienced not just in our midst, but in our hearts as well. For I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So did Jesus really exist or is this just an invention, a legend, or a myth that has come in history? Some scholars have cast doubt on whether Jesus really existed. Um, and one of them is this man called G.A. Wells. He wrote a book by, that is entitled The Jesus Myth. And one of the arguments in his book basically uh, is to suggest that the Bible... Um, hasn't really given us enough evidence to uh, come away to really say that Jesus really existed. This man, Michael Martin, uh, supporting G.A. Wells, uh, also 
adds to that argument. He actually says that Jesus is not placed in a historical context and biographical details of his life are left unspecified. And therefore, a strong prima facie, is that how you pronounce that word? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> oh, man, these legal words. A case challenging the historicity of Jesus can be constructed. That there is enough reason to doubt whether this Jesus really existed or not. Can we establish the historicity of Jesus with a reasonable degree of certainty? I want to suggest to you this morning that yes, we can. This is an area a good number of historians have dedicated their time and effort. Just this topic on whether Jesus really existed. Amongst all the topics you can study in history, this has attracted a lot of attention. And in fact, the people that have dedicated their lives specifically to study the historicity of Jesus Christ. And while some are skeptical, the vast majority of historians, whether Christian or not, in fact, the vast majority of non-Christian historians agree on this particular issue. One of them is this man called Professor Christopher Tackett from Oxford University. He says this, he says that all this does at least render the highly implausible any far-fetched theories that even Jesus' very existence was, was a Christian invention, he says. He goes on to say that the fact that Jesus existed, that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate for whatever reason, and that he had a band of followers who continued to support his cause, seems to be part of the bedrock of the historical tradition. If nothing else, the non-Christian evidence can provide us with certainty on that score. What he's essentially saying is, you don't have to even listen to what scripture says about Jesus. There's enough non-biblical evidence out there from other historians that you can go away saying, if those people can say that Jesus really existed, there's no reason for you to doubt that he actually existed. There's another author called Gary R. Habermans, uh, Hab Habas, sorry. Uh, he wrote a book called The Historical Jesus. He says that very few scholars hold the view that Jesus never lived. Yes, you'll find a few fringe scholars that still question the existence of God, but a vast majority of scholars that are serious historical scholars have never really questioned the existence that this man actually ever lived. This conclusion is generally regarded as a blatant misuse of the available historical data. So if you find a historian who really is questioning whether Jesus ever lived, they're basically misusing the historical data that is available to all of us today. How to establish the fact that Jesus lived? There's basically two things you can do. Number one is to demonstrate the reliability of the New Testament narrative. Can you trust the New Testament story and the narrative of the fact that Jesus lived on earth? And number two, you check the non-biblical sources uh, preferably that come from around that time that Jesus was supposed to have been on this earth and see whether they mention anything about this Jesus. And that's exactly what we're going to do this morning. Are you ready? Have you buckled up? All right. So let's demonstrate that the reliability of the New Testament narrative is something that you don't have to question. The first reason why you can trust, this is very important, guys, the very fact that you can trust the New Testament is based on this very scientific reason. And that is that there's enough manuscripts of the New Testament that are available out there. And the number of them is so overwhelming that you actually don't have to question whether the New Testament is reliable or not. This guy, Professor Helmut Costa, um, classical authors, he says, are often represented by one so, uh, surviving manuscript. So basically classical is basically from the first, second, and third century time. The authors from that time, he says, can be represented by a single manuscript. If there are half a dozen or more, one can speak of a rather advantageous situation for reconstructing the text. 
But then he says this about the New Testament. He says there's about 5,000 manuscripts of the, New, of the Greek New Testament that are in circulation that you actually can go and see for yourself. And you can say, yep, this is verifiable. All the other authors of the, of the same time period that Jesus was supposed to have been here, you can believe that they existed just based on one or two manuscripts, or even six or twelve. But the New Testament has five thousand of them. There's no reason to doubt that. He's, this guy, Gary, says that the New Testament is easily the best attested ancient writing in terms of the number of manuscripts. Uh, ancient classical works have com comparatively few manuscripts, with 20 entire or partial copies generally being an excellent number. So if you've got 20, you'll be celebrating from any author from that time period. But check this out. By comparison, the New Testament has over 5,000 copies. Such a wide difference would provide the New Testament with a much better means of textual criticism, which is crucially important in ascertaining the original readings. The reason why that's important is the fact that you can look at one manuscript and compare it to another, to another, and to another. And if you see some similarities, some consistency, you've got a broad base upon which to stand the ground and, and with a, a, cert a certain level of certainty about what you're actually reading in the New Testament. The second reason why you actually can believe the New Testament is reliable is that the authors and the eyewitnesses of Jesus. In fact, for you to have been considered an apostle in the New Testament, you would have had to have a direct contact with Jesus. So it wasn't about, you know, uh, rumors. Um, Look at what this man, Luke, who was a medical doctor who wrote the book of Luke, had to say. He says this in Luke chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, he goes on to say, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were what? Eyewitnesses. They saw him, they touched him. This is not rumor. And servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated. So this is just a guy who sat in his room and just, you know, wrote whatever came to his mind. He actually took the process, took the time and the process of investigating everything. How? Carefully. It wasn't just random. It wasn't just in a hurry. He actually methodically, carefully investigated from the beginning to write it out for you in consecutive order. Most excellent Theophilus. So he's addressing this person. He's actually prepared this historical account of Jesus. And he's saying, for this is the process I went through, O oh great Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. So Theophilus, you don't have to question what I'm about to write to you because I've taken a painstaking process here to investigate carefully all the things that I'm actually about to write in this book. And hence you have the Gospel of Luke that has gone through that process very carefully. Now, one of the first books ever written that are in the New Testament uh, is actually the book that this man called Paul wrote to the church in Corinthians is the first letter to Corinthians they estimate the date that this letter was written about 50 AD so about 17 years after Jesus had been crucified and had gone back to heaven so not a long time and so he says this in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1 to 8 he says now I make known to you brothers the gospel which I preach to you which also you received in which also you stand then he goes on, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So he's now beginning to narrate what was considered a creed, 
one of the first Christian creeds that was commemorating the sacrifice of Jesus. So he begins, he begins it right here. What I've also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So this is something that Christians would always get together and repeat amongst themselves. It was a creed that they celebrated together. And that he was, a, he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then he goes on to say, and that he appeared to Cephas. Who was who's Cephas, by the way? What's another name for Cephas? Peter, who was one of the 12 disciples. He appears to Peter, then to the 12, and after that he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. It's very hard to make up stuff. For people, 500 people to agree on something. It's hard enough for two people to agree. If you've been married long enough, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> for 500 people to say the same thing, and Jesus appeared to them all at the same time, one time, most of whom remain until now. So at the time he's writing this, these people are still alive that saw Jesus in person after his resurrection. But some have fallen asleep. That means some have died. Then he appeared to James. Who is this James man? James was the half-brother of Jesus that uh, is mentioned in the book of Acts as one of the key leaders of the church after Jesus died and resurrected and went to heaven. He takes on a key leadership role. In fact, he writes one of the books in the New Testament called the book of James. And then he goes on to say then to all the apostles. I want to suggest to you that this James man was one of those that was doubting the messiahship of his half-brother. In fact, they were a bit embarrassed by this Jesus because he was doing some crazy things around the community. And as a family, they were like, they were trying to get Jesus to, you know, tone it down a little bit, Jesus. But after Jesus was raised from the dead, that radically changed this man's life. That he takes on the leadership role in the, in the, in the, in the church community in the New Testament. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. So Jesus, uh, Jesus also appeared to Paul. As Paul is going on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians, Jesus in person appears to him and his life is never the same again. And so the people that were present uh, at the time that Jesus was alive were people that were quoted as having said that they actually saw him as eyewitnesses. One of the things that you find is that... Um, for instance, in this book of John 21, is that there are people that actually wrote um, some things about Jesus. And not everything that was done by Jesus was actually captured in historical records. It says there, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, then it goes on to say, I suppose not even the whole world itself could contain the books that will be written about this Jesus of Nazareth. And so there's a very good historical reason for you to really believe that the New Testament writers were not just mucking around, that they did, they did just come up with stories. Their, 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 their work was um, rigorous, it was authentic, and it was, it was good, serious historical work. The third reason why you can believe the um, New Testament is the basic authenticity of a story. If you were going to come up with a story about the king of your religion or the god of your religion, and you're just trying to make up a good story, there are some things you cannot include in the story, especially things that do not portray him in positive light, especially in the culture that you're writing in. The writers did not seek to tell a vanished story. They, they didn't seek to polish the story of Jesus to make it look nice. They just told the story as it actually unfolded in history. One of them is this idea of women being present. In fact, the first eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus. That detail in the New Testament is probably one of the most telling 
uh, indications of why the New Testament is authentic and real. The only reason you can say that women were first witnesses of the resurrection, the most important event in the history of Christianity, and the first people that were there to witness it were, were women, at least in the audience of the first century, this was very hard to sell because the, the, the testimony of women was not even allowed in court. They couldn't be trusted. Um, and so for you to include this detail in the New Testament record, the only reason you do that is because it actually truly happened in that fashion. Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Um, it's just a touching thing, actually, when you read how Jesus interacts with women in, in Scripture and, uh, and how he uplifts women, especially in that culture that was so misogynistic and, and really, you know, pulled, pulled down the role of women in, in, in society. But Jesus comes along, and in fact, the most people that bankrolled the ministry of Jesus for three and a half years were women. And they supported his work right through. And, and you find that uh, as a very, very powerful thing to testify about the fact that Jesus, uh, his story is authentic. The second reason why his story is authentic is because of the way that the New Testament writers portray him, associating himself with the, the downs and outs of society. If you want to make your God to look good, you want to make him look like he associates with the rich and the powerful and the famous. But that's not what you find in the New Testament. Jesus was known to hang around the less fortunate, the poor, the widows, even children, even women. That those were the kinds of people that Jesus would hang around. In fact, it says, then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors who were considered a scum in society, people that you didn't want to even be friends with, and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. The cultural significance of sharing a meal back in those days was huge. You're spending time to dip in the same plate with, you know, with someone. The bonding that is supposed to actually happen, what actually that communicates is that we are building community together. That was a huge, huge thing. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and with the sinners? If you are making a story about Jesus as a legend, as a legend and a myth, you will not include that detail in the story. The only reason you do that is because it's actually true and it actually happened. The third reason why the story is authentic in the New Testament is this idea of the humiliation of Jesus, which is basically the zenith of the story. The climax of a gospel story is that Jesus went to the cross and died as a criminal. Capital punishment. Why would you include that story if you're just trying to make up a story about this man that you're supposed to sell to the world as a myth and a legend? The reason why you do that is because this is actually what happened. No wonder this man, Bruce L. Shelley, who was a Christian historian, would say this, this about Christianity. And this is what makes Christianity very different from all the other religions. It says that Christianity is the only major religion to have at its central event the humiliation of its God. Because every other religion, it doesn't matter what other religion it is, the God of that religion requires you to humiliate yourself or to sacrifice yourself to have access to him. It, the onus is on you to please him. But the God of this book, the Bible, he comes down and humiliates himself so that you and I can have access to him. What a beautiful picture of God we find. That the central event of this God of the Bible is his own humiliation and his death on the cross of Calvary. 
So we've surveyed the New Testament and seen that it's actually reliable. You actually can count on it. And it's something that you actually can walk away with a reasonable degree of confidence to say it is, uh, it is authentic and it is true. What about extra biblical sources? Um, there's this man called the, the Flav, Flavius Josephus. Um, he was a Jewish historian who lived the, around the same time that Jesus was alive, the first century historian. And uh, during the Roman invasion of Jerusalem, when the temple was destroyed, uh, this guy was actually a general of the Jewish army. But the Romans crushed the revolt, crushed the revolution about in Jerusalem, and took him with them to Rome. And while he's in Rome, he writes a history of the Jewish people, of Jerusalem. He's probably missing home as he's writing this. In fact, you can find uh, some of his writings in, Ox in the Oxford um, uh, Library uh, in, in England. He says there, he says, and so he convened, so the he there is um, uh, um, the, um, the high priest of uh, the, the man that put Jesus uh, on the cross uh, through the Romans. And so he convened the judges of the Sanhedrin and brought before him, so that's the high priest, brought before them a man named James, the brother of Jesus who was called the Christ and certain others. He's mentioning this detail almost in passing because at that time Jesus was not a big deal. He didn't realize how big Jesus was going to be in, in centuries to come. That the Christian religion and the Christian faith was going to grow in leaps and bounds and, and reach all over the world. So he's just mentioning that, hey, there came a point where the high priest convened the Sanhedrin together and they actually killed. One of the men that was killed was James, who was the brother of all. He had a brother called Jesus who had actually lived there. He accused them of having transgressed the law and delivered them up to be stoned. Those of the inhabitants of the city who were considered the most fair-minded and who were strict in observance of the law were offended at this. The reason why you can take Josephus seriously, this man was not a Christian uh, in any measure. He, he wasn't uh, pushing an agenda for Christianity at all. He's just a Jewish guy writing a history there. And he kind of remembered that there was this guy who made some difference in, in Jerusalem and in, in, in Palestine back in those days. He had a brother called James that was eventually killed. And that other historian, so we're not just going to rely on one source. It's always good to establish something with more than one source of evidence. Marabah Serapion, this guy was a Syrian... Um, Roman Syrian guy who is a historian, very smart man, and um, he wrote in his book from prison. In fact, he was in prison, um, and he's writing a letter to his son. And he says to his son, "What good did he do to the Athenians to kill Socrates, for which deed they were punished with famine and pestilence? What did it avail the Samians to burn Pythagoras?" That takes me back to my high school mathematics class. <laughs> Since their country was entirely buried under sand in one moment, he says, or what did it avail the Jews to kill their wise king? He mentions that. Since their kingdom was taken away from them uh, from that time on, God justly avenged these three wise men. The Athenians died of famine, the Samians were flooded by the sea. The Jews were slaughtered and driven from their kingdom, everywhere living in the dispersion. Socrates is not dead, thanks to Plato, nor Pythagoras because of Hera's statue, nor is the wise king because of the new law which he has given. All historians right across the board agree that this wise king that this man is referring to cannot be any other person except Jesus Christ. 
The last source we go to was a Roman intellectual uh, historian by the name of Tacitus. Oh, man, these names. I'm glad I wasn't born in that period. He says this about how Nero, uh, the, the background to this is Nero started a fire in Rome. In fact, burnt a good chunk of the city. Uh, about 64 AD. And for him to sort of get away with it, he came up with a good excuse. He said, I'm going to blame this new bunch of people called Christians. And so we're going to turn our guns on them and persecute them. So he says of Nero, but neither human help nor imperial munificence, nor all the modes of placating heaven could stifle scandal or dispel belief that the fire had taken place by order. Therefore, to scotch the rumor, Nero substituted as culprits and punished with the utmost refinements of cruelty, a class of men loathed for their vices, whom the crowd styled Christians, he says. Christus, the founder of the name, which is obviously is referring to Christ, had undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius by sentence of the pro procurator, Pontius Pilate, and the pernicious superstition was checked for a moment. At least three non-biblical sources that are reliable historical uh, sources that establish that they might, not that they might, there was a man uh, that lived in the first century uh, that is called Jesus. Only to break out once more, not merely in Judea, the home of the disease, but in the capital itself, where all things horrible or shameful in the world uh, collect and find a vogue. And so, my friends, this morning, I want to present to you this Jesus. Uh, not only is he a historical figure, not only can you trust that he really lived, you can also trust that the claims he made about himself were true. That he is the son of God. That he is who he says he is. And that he actually can change our lives today. In fact, let me suggest to you that this Jesus of history can be a Jesus of your story. That it can be a personal relationship about him that you and I can enjoy. I... Um, Remember when I was about the age of 20, I uh, just turned up to uni. Uh, I was a time in my, that was a time in my life I was sort of not sure about my life. I kind of felt confused about everything. I'd left Kenya, you know, young. I was in the Philippines all by myself. No one did I, you know, I didn't have any friends there. So I was, this, I was in this no man's land in my life. And I think... At that time in my life, my life could have taken any turn, any which way. One day, I go into the bookstore that was located on campus, on, on the university campus. I go upstairs, and I found that I actually was selling books. And one of the books that was selling there was a book that my dad had told me about. Uh, you know, as a kid growing up, he kept telling me to read that book because he was at home that whole, that whole time I grew up uh, back home in Kenya. But just never found time to read it because TV was more interesting or play was more interesting. Or I had assignments to do. There's always a reason why I couldn't read the book. But for some reason this day, I just had this restlessness in my life. I walked over to, the, to, to where that shelf was, that book, and I picked it up. And I opened the first, pa the, the first uh, page of the book. It had a very, very powerful question for me that changed the direction of my life. The question was, do you know Jesus or do you only know about him? Boy, oh boy. That was 10 tons of dynamite in my life. You see, up to that point, even though I grew up going to church, heard all the sermons, I'd never known that there's a distinction between knowing about Jesus and knowing him as a person. I picked up that book. 
I went to the storekeeper. I asked, how much is this? She said, 30 pesos. I didn't have my wallet with me. I rushed to my dormitory. I got my wallet and I paid my 30 pesos. And for the first time in my life, I ever, in my life ever, read a book from cover to cover. And that book is Steps to Christ that led me to a deeper desire to read the Bible for myself. And so we can talk about Jesus at a historical and philosophical level, but until this becomes a personal thing, until you can hear his voice, as he says in, Rome, uh, in, in Revelation chapter 3, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And then he says, If anyone hears my voice. You see, Jesus doesn't just knock without saying something. He knocks while he's asking, Are you there? He's mentioning you by name. Obed, can you hear me? And you can put your name right there. And he says, if you can open the door of your heart, he says, I'll come in and I'll dine with you. There is no any other God in any other religion in the world that has that personal interest in your life, that is personal for him, that even if you are the only person that lived on this earth in need of a savior to come and die for you, he would still come and go to the cross just for you. Because for him, you're not a statistic. You're his child. And getting to know him means eternal life. And that is why the Bible says in 17 chap 17th chapter of John, verse 3, that this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This God of the Bible not only knows you, but he desperately wants you to know him too. Because as you get to know him in Jesus, that is eternal life. I'm grateful for this Savior we have found in Jesus. Not only is he our God, but he desires to be our best friend. That is why he says in John chapter 15 to his disciples, he says that I've said all these things to you because I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. What a God we have in Scripture. And Father, as we conclude this series called Reasoned, even for those of us that may have uh, never really had any serious doubts about this, I pray that this has reestablished our confidence in the biblical narrative that we stand on solid ground and if there's anyone here today that has maybe for the first time uh, considered seriously the veracity of scripture I pray that they can walk from this place with the certainty of the assurance of of Jesus because he's actually in their lives today and so father I pray that uh, you leave us you as we leave this place you go with us and bless us as we go into this new week. And I pray that as we see each other next week, that I will, will be careful to give you all the glory and honor. And so thank you so much for everything, because we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.